In a Montana hillside 12,600 years ago, a child was laid to rest with extraordinary care. His small body, dusted with sacred red ochre, was surrounded by over a hundred exquisitely crafted stone points and bone tools. A fortune in Ice Age currency. This child, known to science as Anzic I, would sleep undisturbed for millennia while mammoths vanished, glaciers retreated, and civilizations rose and fell above him. When geneticists finally decoded his DNA in 2014, they discovered something remarkable. This ancient boy carried within his cells the story of how humans conquered two continents, a genetic time capsule that would overturn decades of archaeological dogma and reveal the true origins of the mysterious Clovis people. For decades, the Clovis First model dominated American archaeology, the idea that Clovis people were the first humans in the Americas. This created what archaeologists call the Clovis problem. How could these people have spread across two continents so rapidly? Why do we find older sites in South America than North America? And most puzzling of all, if they were first, why does their DNA tell a different story? The story of the Clovis culture doesn't begin with their distinctive fluted spear points or mammoth kills across North America. It reaches back into the frozen depths of the last glacial maximum, when sea levels dropped so dramatically that a vast subcontinent emerged between Siberia and Alaska. This was Beringia, not merely a land bridge, as it's often dismissively called but a refuge the size of Australia where the ancestors of all Native Americans would spend thousands of years becoming genetically and culturally distinct from their Asian relatives. Recent genomic studies have pinpointed this transformation with remarkable precision. Between 23,000 and 20,000 BC, populations stranded in Beringia underwent a unique genetic mixing event. Roughly 65% of their ancestry derived from East Asian populations, carrying the genetic signatures of groups that had slowly migrated northward through Siberia. The remaining 35% came from a more enigmatic source, the ancient North Eurasians, a phantom population known primarily through the genome of a Siberian boy buried at Malta near Lake Baikal some 24,000 years ago. This ancient North Eurasians ancestry would prove crucial as it's found in all Native Americans, but absent in modern East Asians, serving as a genetic fingerprint of Beringian isolation. During their millennia-long sojourn in Beringia, these populations weren't simply waiting. They were adapting, evolving, and developing the skills needed to thrive in some of Earth's harshest environments. Genetic evidence suggests they maintained a population of perhaps only a few thousand individuals, small enough to develop distinctive genetic markers, yet large enough to preserve the diversity needed for the epic journey ahead. The genetic clock tells us that around 16,000 BC, as glaciers began their slow retreat, the Beringian population experienced a dramatic expansion. This wasn't a single exodus, but rather a complex series of migrations that would eventually populate two continents. The mitochondrial DNA evidence paints a particularly vivid picture of these movements. Most Native Americans carry one of five major mitochondrial haplogroups A2, B2, C1, D1, and X2A. These maternal lineages, passed unchanged from mother to child, act like genetic breadcrumbs marking ancient migration routes. The Anzic One child carried haplogroup D4H3A, a rare coastal variant that tells its own remarkable story. This same lineage appears in ancient remains from the Pacific coast of South America, including early burials in the Andes suggesting that some groups may have followed the Pacific Rim in a rapid coastal migration between 13,000 and 11,000 BC. The Y chromosome data from Anzic I provides the paternal side of this story. He belonged to haplogroup QL54, an ancestral form of the QM3 lineage that would later dominate Native American populations. This paternal marker originated in Siberia but underwent crucial mutations during the Beringian standstill. The timing of these mutations, particularly the emergence of QM3 and QZ780 between 12,000 and 10,000 BC, provides an independent confirmation of when these populations entered the Americas and began diversifying. What makes the Anzic I genome particularly fascinating is its unexpected affinity with Central and South American populations, rather than North American groups. This suggests that the Clovis people were part of an early wave that moved rapidly southward with some populations reaching the southern cone of South America, while others remained in North America. This rapid initial dispersal was followed by regional isolation and differentiation, creating the diverse history of Native American populations we see today. 
the Clovis culture, flourishing between approximately 10,800 and 10,550 BC, represents not the first Americans, but rather the first widespread technological complex in the New World. Their signature innovation, the Clovis Point, was a masterpiece of Stone Age engineering. These distinctive spear points, typically three to six inches long, featured a concave base with dramatic flutes or channels running up both faces. Creating these flutes required extraordinary skill. A single misstruck blow could shatter hours of careful work. Archaeological sites across North America have yielded thousands of these points, from Blackwater Draw in New Mexico, where the culture was first identified, to the Galt site in Texas, where over 600,000 Clovis artifacts have been recovered. At Dent, Colorado, Clovis points were found among the bones of at least 13 mammoths. The Lenner and Naco sites in Arizona preserved kill sites where Clovis hunters took down mammoth and bison, their broken weapons still lodged between ancient ribs. But Clovis technology extended far beyond their famous points. They crafted specialized tools for every aspect of Ice Age life. End scrapers for processing hides, gravers for working bone and antler, blades for butchering, and the mysterious Clovis blade core technology that could produce dozens of razor-sharp cutting implements from a single stone. The Anzac burial provides our most intimate glimpse into Clovis culture beyond their stone tools. The careful treatment of this child's body, the red ochre symbolizing life or blood, the wealth of perfectly crafted artifacts speaks to complex spiritual beliefs and social structures. The sheer value of the grave goods, representing hundreds of hours of skilled labor, suggests this wasn't simply a grieving family, but an entire community investing in ritual and meaning. Clovis people lived in a world of extraordinary abundance and danger. The late Pleistocene Americas teemed with megafauna, mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, and short-faced bears that stood 12 feet tall. Clovis hunters developed strategies to take down these massive creatures, likely using sophisticated knowledge of animal behavior, landscape features, and coordinated group tactics. Isotope analysis of Clovis age human remains suggests a diet heavy in large game, though they certainly supplemented this with smaller animals, fish, and plant foods, as evidenced by grinding stones and diverse tool assemblages. Their artistic expression, while rare in the archaeological record, hints at rich symbolic lives. Beyond the Anzac burial, we find beveled ivory rods that may have been foreshafts or ceremonial objects, stones with incised geometric patterns, and the careful selection of exotic, beautifully coloured stones for their finest points materials traded across hundreds of miles, suggesting extensive social networks spanning the continent. The Anzac One genome definitively resolved one of archaeology's most contentious debates, the proposed European origins of Clovis culture. The Solitrean hypothesis, championed by archaeologists Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley, suggested that Clovis technology derived from the Solitrean culture of Ice Age Europe, with ancient Europeans crossing the Atlantic via the Ice Edge route around 20,000 BC. Proponents pointed to similarities in stone tool technology, particularly the practice of overshot flaking, shared by both cultures. However, the genetic evidence from Anzic one proved conclusively that Clovis people descended from Asian populations, not Europeans. The child's genome showed typical Native American ancestry, the East Asian and ancient North Eurasian mixture that occurred in Beringia, with no trace of European genetic markers that would be expected if the solitary and hypothesis were correct. This genetic verdict, combined with the absence of solitary and style art, bone technology, and other cultural elements in Clovis sites, has led most archaeologists to reject the Atlantic crossing theory. The debate now centers on the roots and timing of the initial peopling of the Americas. Two main theories dominate current discussions. The ice-free corridor hypothesis proposes that the first Americans waited until a passable route opened between the Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets around 15,000 BC, then moved south through the interior of North America. The coastal migration theory, increasingly supported by genetic and archaeological evidence, suggests earlier populations followed the Pacific coast, possibly using boats, before 14,000 BC. The coastal route theory gains support from the D4H3A, mitochondrial lineage found in Anzic I. This haplogroup's distribution along the Pacific Rim, from Alaska to Chile, traces what might have been humanity's fastest long-distance migration. The theory also better explains pre-Clovis sites like Monte Verde in Chile, dated to around 12,550 BC, a thousand years before Clovis culture appeared. 
if the first Americans had travelled solely through the interior corridor. It seems unlikely they would have reached the southern cone of South America so quickly. Recent genetic discoveries have revealed that the story of Native American origins is more complex than a simple split from Asian populations. In 2018, researchers analyzed the genome of an infant girl from Upward Sun River in Alaska, dated to approximately 9550 BC. This child, along with a related infant from the same site, belonged to a previously unknown population dubbed the Ancient Beringians. The Ancient Beringians represent a branch that split from other Native Americans, before the divergence of Northern and Southern Native American lineages. This discovery suggests that multiple, closely related populations emerged from the Beringian Refugium, each taking slightly different paths into the Americas. The Clovis people, as represented by Anzic I, belonged to the lineage that gave rise to most modern Native Americans, while the ancient Beringians represented an earlier split that remained in Alaska and subsequently disappeared or was absorbed into later populations. One of the most tantalizing mysteries about the Clovis people concerns their language. Linguistic diversity in the Americas is staggering hundreds of languages falling into numerous apparently unrelated families. The genetic evidence from Clovis era remains suggests that most Native American populations derive from a single founding population, which would support theories of linguistic unity followed by diversification. Some linguists have proposed that all Native American languages except the Naden and Eskimo Aleut families, which represent later migrations, descend from a single Amerin superfamily. However, this remains highly controversial, as 12,000 years is an enormous time depth for linguistic reconstruction, far beyond the roughly 6,000 year limit of traditional historical linguistics. What we can infer is that Clovis peoples must have had sophisticated language to coordinate complex hunts, maintain continental scale trade networks, and transmit the detailed technical knowledge required for their remarkable stone tool technology. The standardization of Clovis point styles across thousands of miles suggests strong cultural transmission mechanisms, likely including detailed verbal instructions passed from master craftsmen to apprentices. The end of Clovis culture around 10,550 BC coincides with one of the most dramatic periods in Earth's recent history. The Younger Dryas, a sudden return to Ice Age conditions that lasted over a thousand years, began abruptly around 10,800 BC. Some researchers have proposed that this cooling was triggered by a comet impact or air burst, pointing to a black matte layer found at many Clovis sites, microscopic diamonds, and other potential impact markers. Whether caused by cosmic impact, changing ocean currents, or other factors, the Younger Dryas profoundly affected both human populations and the megafauna they hunted. Within centuries of Clovis culture's disappearance, most large Ice Age mammals in the Americas went extinct. What's certain is that post-Clovis cultures had to adapt to dramatically different environments. The Folsom culture that followed in the Great Plains focused on now extinct forms of giant bison. In the eastern woodlands, populations developed diverse archaic traditions, emphasizing smaller game, fish, and plant resources. These adaptations set the stage for the eventual development of agriculture and complex societies across the Americas. The genetic legacy of the Clovis people lives on in modern Native American populations. Studies of contemporary indigenous peoples from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego reveal the deep connections forged during those crucial centuries around 11,000 BC. The same Y-chromosome lineages that appeared in Anzic I, particularly haplogroup QM3, are found in high frequencies throughout the Americas. Similarly, the mitochondrial lineages present in Clovis-era populations continue to dominate Native American maternal ancestry. This genetic continuity demolishes earlier archaeological theories about multiple replacement populations, or recent migrations overwriting earlier peoples. We still don't know exactly when the first people entered the Americas, or which routes they took. We don't fully understand how pre-Clovis populations relate to Clovis culture, or why Clovis technology spread so rapidly before disappearing just as quickly. The languages they spoke, the songs they sang, the stories they told around their campfires, all of this remains silent in the archaeological record. Each revelation, whether from a child's grave in Montana, or a footprint preserved in ancient mud, adds another piece to the vast puzzle of human migration and adaptation. If this deep dive into history, culture and genetics fascinated you, let me know in the comments what aspect you found most interesting. Please subscribe for more detailed explorations of human genetic history. I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.